All right, what is going on, Bullish Bears? So, I recognize that it's been a little bit of time, but uh, here we are with part three of the Daily Trading Coach, 101 Lessons for Becoming Your Own Trading Psychologist by Brett N. Steenbarger. So this section is gonna focus on psychological well-being and using that to enhance your trading experience. Okay? Now the quote for this chapter is, happiness is the meaning and the purpose of life, the whole aim and end of human existence. So what if trading is gonna be making you absolutely miserable, then what's the point, right? Because the whole point of becoming a trader is to experience more freedom and more happiness and more enjoyment, all right? So here we go. Let's get into this. The importance of feeling good. One of the most overrated variables in trading psychology is passion. So people talk about all the time how they have passion for the markets and how they have passion for what they're doing. But passion only weakly correlates with how hard a trader will actually work to get good at their craft, to get good at um, learning how to trade and be successful and be profitable. Because passion uh, is a good or bad thing, right? So it's not always necessarily a positive thing because too much passion can lead to things like uh, traders who are desperate for profits, traders who live and breathe the market 24 seven without giving themselves a break, uh, traders who are addicted to the market, um, you know, like a gambler is addicted, um, you know, to the, to the table. And uh, all these things that are viewed as passion are, are negative, um, negative effects of that passion and that uh, uh, infatuation, right? So desire and motivation are necessary for market success, but these two things alone are not enough to get you all the way through, right? So desire and motivation will get you on the field, but then to win the game, that requires a whole different set of skills. So rather than focusing on passion, what traders want to do is focus on the overall emotional tone of their market experiences. Basically what that means is, are you experiencing meaningful happiness, contentment, and motivation every time you sit down to trade, every time you sit down to study, to interact, every time you um, engage in your craft, are you creating these meaningful experiences, okay? In short, are you enjoying what you're doing? Because if you hate every second of trading, uh, obviously it's just gonna cause you pain in life and you're, uh, you're not going to be successful at it because you're going to hate it, what you're doing. Okay. So if the things we listed before are the negative side of emotional experience, the positive side of emotional exp experience is known as psychological well-being. Okay. So a person with high uh, psychological well-being experiences things like positivity, uh, favorable expectations, uh, positive physical state, uh, a positive appraisal of self and life, and favorable relations with the people that are around them, right? So just overall, they're happier and uh, everything they do just has a good, happy, you know, tint to it, right? So not miserable. <laughs> now, to be clear, no one feels happy all the time, okay? That's unrealistic. In, in, true, in true life, you know, good, feeling good and feeling happy, that will come and go because life is life and life will throw things at you and you will experience rough times. Um, so saying that we need to make sure that we're happy all the time is unrealistic. Now, the one disclaimer for this is there are people who are chronically unable to experience positive emotions, and those people require the assistance of an experienced, licensed medical health, mental health professional. Okay. So the things outlined in this chapter, um, if you are uh, experiencing uh, chronic inability uh, to experience positive emotions, um, some of these things may not quite be for you, okay? Um, and, it, and with that, definitely 100%, uh, go talk to somebody, you know, talk to a licensed medical health professional and get the help um, that you need because, you know, nobody, I, I don't want you guys to be experiencing any of that. I, I would not wish that on anyone. So we want to make sure that everybody is, you know, as level and, and able to experience happiness, um, you know, all the same all the time. But for most people outside of that disclaimer, the varying balance of positive and negative emotion can be attributed to personality type and then the environment that you're in and how um, you react to that environment. So much of psychological well-being is a function 
of the fit between a person and their social and work environments. So it's kind of a balance of everything. It's not, it's not just, oh, I need to make sure that just my trading experiences are positive or, oh, I need to make sure that, you know, um, just like my experiences at home are positive. It's all of it. You want to shift all of it because if you are incredibly, uh, having incredibly negative experiences in, in one portion of your life, it will bleed into everything else. Okay. So when you, when you have some, when you have an emotion or when you have a viewpoint and your life affirms your values and needs, you enjoy positive emotions. And then those positive emotions serve as a life barometer, which lets you know, um, whether you're doing what's right or how far you are from being right for yourself or wrong for yourself, depending on your ideas um, and your values. So why is this important to trading? Okay. Well, trading well, learning, developing, and succeeding in your efforts to help your positive emotions outweigh your negative emotions over time are what we're, what we're striving for, okay? So we're not trying to remove negative emotions or mute negative emotions. Uh, we want to allow those uh, negative emotions to still, we want to allow ourselves to still experience those negative emotions. We just want the positive emotions to outweigh the negative experiences over time. So the dominant emotional experience of your work should be the pride, satisfaction, and sense of accomplishments that give you energy and optimism. So when you sit and think about uh, learning new things, researching new things, uh, you know, going over and back testing trades or looking over trades or trying to, you know, compare things. If your overall sense when you think of doing that is dread, that's what we're trying to get rid of. We want to make sure that you feel good, you know, it, not necessarily that every single trade is green and that you're a millionaire, but just that the process overall, you have a sense of pride, satisfaction, that you, that you're proud of your growth, that you're proud of what you're learning, that you, that you're happy and optimistic for what is still left to be learned. Okay. Because if you're not growing, developing and finding success, your experience is apt to be negative and negative experiences, you know, we don't, we don't usually follow through with negative experiences. If we hate every second of it, uh, what are the chances that we're going to want to do the work to continue hating every second of it, right? And ultimately, um, we're going to have a terrible negative experience and the chances that will actually become profitable are very low. So less feelings of satisfaction, energy, and optimism equals more feelings of frustration, overload, and discouragement. So frustration, overload, and discouragement, you know, those are... Those are the, ah, like, I'm never, I'm never going to get this and I'm never going to understand this. And, and trading is just gambling and, and I'm never going to be good enough for this. We want to eliminate that. Right. And the only way to eliminate that, um, is to encourage those feelings of satisfaction, energy, and optimism. Energy and optimism generated by happiness and personal fulfillment are what sustain a trader's learning curve. Right? So again, if passion is what gets us on the field, the energy and optimism to practice and to learn and to be open and have discussions. That is what gets you through the game. Okay. And uh, that is what helps you sustain that positive learning curve so you can continue to grow. All right. So positive traders with high well being are more likely to have fueled concentration and make extra efforts that result in superior, superior internalization of patterns. They're more apt to have the confidence to aggressively pursue good trades and lay off marginal ones. That's important. Remember, we want to always be taking those a plus trades. And if something seems a little fishy, well, then you just let it go because your, your probability of success is highest when you're only swinging at those pitches that are directly in your strike zone. So, uh, high well-being traders are less likely to make impulsive trades out of frustration and they're more likely to have the resilience needed to weather losing periods. And we've all been there. You know, we have times when, you know, we have a, a stretch where the market's not doing what we want to be doing. We're not seeing our setups. We're not seeing, um, we're not seeing things or we're not feeling good, right? You have, you can have a time when you're going through something, uh, personally and, and you're just not in the mindset to trade. Well, if you have a high well-being, you will have the resilience to know that that's just a phase and it's not going to get to the point where it's going to discourage you from um, trading altogether. Emotional well-being fuels cognitive efficacy. So when we think best, we feel good. Um, and I mean, that's, that's fairly simple, right? When you're feeling good and you're in a good mood, you're more level headed. You can be more objective, um, when you're trading and you just overall, you're sharper and you just, you think better. Okay. 
a constructive step to take would be to track your emotional experience over time. Uh, so definitely like going back to this journaling and going back to keeping track of how you're feeling and what you're thinking, uh, never a bad idea. Okay. Always, uh, keep track of your emotional experiences through all your trades and, uh, add that to your journal so that you know what you're feeling because this tells you whether you're emotionally in the zone or swimming against emotional currents. You always want to have the wind at your back, right? You never want to be, you never want every single thing to be a struggle. And if every single thing is going to be a struggle, then over time, if you don't have that resilience, it's going to break you down. And then if you're struggling with negative emotions on top of that, then you're way more apt to quit. So that is what we want to keep track of so that we know, Hey, you know, I'm going, uh, I'm, I'm struggling with things. I'm, I'm fighting things or no, you know what? Everything right now has been good. These choices that I'm making, uh, are positive towards, or are, are contributing to positive emotional experiences and positive growth. And I feel in the zone right now, that kind of thing. Okay. So it's time for a feelings checklist. So we talk about keeping track of your emotions and keeping track of, um, how you're feeling. So just right now, Okay. Uh, what you want to do is I'm going to put some stuff up on the screen here, and then you want to check the adjective that best describes how you're feeling right now. Okay. And the way the scoring is going to work for this is if you are feeling the top emotion, you add one point. If you are feeling the middle emotion, you add zero points. And if you're feeling the lower emotion, uh, you subtract a point. Okay. So first one, we're just going to use this one, happy, neutral, and unhappy. How are you feeling? Next one is satisfied, neutral, or disappointed. Energetic, neutral, or run down. Optimistic, neutral, or pessimistic. Focused, neutral, or scattered. Calm, neutral, or stressed out. Competent, neutral, or incompetent. Growing, neutral, or stagnant. All right. So if everybody wrote, uh, has their number down, okay? So what you want to do now is you want to add up your totals. And if your score is four or higher, then you want to review and identify the things that you're doing right to keep your mood positive. If you're, if you're, if your score is four or higher, chances are you are currently experiencing a positive mood. So you want to break down the things that you have been doing that are putting you in a positive mood and then, and then just continue doing those things or try to recreate those things so that you continue to grow that positivity. If your score is, um, negative four or lower, then you want to review and identify the things you're doing wrong to keep your mindset negative. And then you want to try to, find ways to remedy those things that you might be doing wrong, um, that are causing you, um, you know, emotional negativity or, or that are causing your mindset to be negative. And if you're somewhere in the middle between that negative four and positive four, um, which I think most people are, then what you want to do is go back and review and identify what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong on the different days that you're feeling those things or the, or the different trades when you're feeling those things. And that way you can do more of the things that are, that are encouraging you and causing positivity and then try to do less of the things that are discouraging you and causing negativity. So you want to try to tra tailor your daily activities to tip the balance in favor of a more positive experience. Okay. So it's not necessary that you feel good after every single trading day. So that's unrealistic. We're going to have days where we, we feel bad. We have days where, um, you know, what do they say? Opportunities for growth. Okay. That doesn't necessarily always feel good. Um, so, uh, having the idea that you're going to feel good after every single trading day is unrealistic. So keep that in mind. What matters is the balance over time of positive and negative emotional experiences. So taking your emotional temperature at the end of each trading day can help you narrow down the specific trading behaviors that aid and damage your mood. So if you say, oh man, uh, I'm taking this, you know, test and I'm right now I'm at a, I'm at a negative six. Well, man, what happened today that made me, that made me, you know, have feel all these negative emotions. So let's go back through all the trades, through all the different things. Is there something I didn't understand? Is there something that I was too arrogant about? Is there something that I, I didn't know? Is there something that, uh, you know, was there a time when I, when I overthought something or didn't think enough? And that kind of helps you, um, kind of narrow down your emotional state for that day. 
Now, what's important to note is the idea of trading without emotion is a lie. Okay, we're humans. We can't ignore our emotions. Okay, but if you because if you care about your performance, your feelings are going to engage when you put your capital at risk to pursue your goals. So I think what people sometimes tend to forget is that when you place a trade, you are making a financial decision, right? You are putting capital um, into the market in order to create more capital. That is what your hope is. Okay. So as a human, there are so many things attached to that, that you are bound to feel emotions. Okay. So the goal is to use those emotional engagements to your favor through self coaching. And that's pretty much the foundation of what this entire book is about. The daily trading coach is you want to make sure that you are, uh, using your emotional engagements to help you, uh, throughout your trading journey. And that way you can sustain your positive emotions and bring out the best in yourself, which is the ultimate goal for every single trader. Build your happiness. All right. This might seem a little basic, but stick with me here. Okay. Cause this all builds, uh, all these, all these themes build on each other. <clears throat> what is happiness? Well, there's two components of psychological well-being, joy and contentment. Well, happiness is the fulfillment that comes from joy and contentment. Okay. Happiness is the sense of actualizing one's potential and being the person that you're capable of becoming. So it's that idea that you're doing what you're meant to be doing, um, you know, uh, in your approach to anything in life. So then if that's what happiness is, what is the opposite of happiness? Well, the opposite is a vague existential guilt that you're letting life's opportunities slip by you or this idea that you're settling for less than you rightfully should, right? The opposite of happiness is day after day, you feel like you're selling yourself short in your career, your relationships and your personal development. You feel like you're not like, like you're not like you're not good enough. You're not living up to your potential. Now, the tough thing is it's almost impossible to build durable, productive confidence which then equals growth on a foundation of guilt. So in order to begin to grow, you have to make sure that you have the correct foundation that allows that growth. So, uh, how do we create satisfaction and happiness? Well, we do it by immersing ourselves in fulfilling activities. So, uh, when it comes to trading, you know, you can say, uh, you might get some satisfaction from getting lucky on a green trade. You know, you say I, I bought into XYZ stock and I was hoping that it, that it went up and the price went up. So, Yay, I'm green. Okay. Uh, so you can get some satisfaction from that, but you will ultimately gain a greater lasting satisfaction. If you develop a hypothesis, create a plan, execute that plan, and then you have a green trade because you're doing work towards that goal, right? Because just getting lucky on a trade is a gift. You did nothing to really earn that, but creating a green trade is validation of choice and confirmation of all the work that you've put in, uh, towards that hypothesis, towards that trade plan, towards creating that profit for yourself. So why do traders often feel empty because of the markets? Well, traders feel pleasure when they win. They feel pain when they lose, okay? but they still lack the deep inner sense of satisfaction and joy possible only to those who are pursuing a calling. Now, this is important because a lot of traders, uh, especially at the beginning, they approach the markets as, well, I need to learn the bare minimum I need to learn in order to just make some money and then that's it. Well, the problem is that you're not immersing yourself in the entire market and you're not learning and growing. So the chances that you're going to be successful by doing the bare minimum are very low. Okay. Most of these traders who think this way are traders are traders that are hoping that profits are going to bring happiness, right? When in truth, it's the opposite. So once you start immersing yourself in the process, the process will bring happiness, which will then bring profits. It's not, I need to do the bare minimum so I can start making profits so I can start feeling happy. It's I'm really happy learning and I'm really happy growing and I'm really happy um, doing these things in the market. And because I'm very happy and because I'm very, um, and because I'm growing through these things, then profits come. So we profit from our life's endeavors when we pursue our happiness. So that's what you want to keep in mind um, with trading is that you ultimately profit when you're pursuing your happiness in the endeavor that is a, a uh, trading career or trading growth. 
The goal should be to build a depth of experience for building a business, not just making profits. So take the entire market experience as a whole. You want to uh, immerse yourself in everything and not just do the bare minimum you need to do to try to make some profits. Many quote unquote bar fly traders approach the market like a pickup artist approaches sex at a bar, right? So if you are a pickup artist and you go to a bar just for sex, you're not doing any of the work to really build any kind of relationship. You just walk in, you walk into the market when, when it's open and you say, well, sometimes I'm going to get lucky. Sometimes I'm not going to get lucky, but I'm not going to do any real work to learn anything or to build anything or to grow or to understand anything more because I'm just going to walk into the market when it's open and take my chances. And if I win, I win. If I lose, I lose. And then I leave. Okay. So that is not the correct approach, um, for, for trading and for the market. Now, a happy trader is immersed in the process of trading and find, finds fulfillment from the process even when markets aren't open. And this is really important because how many times have you heard someone say, well, what fun are the markets if they're not open and active? This is the mindset of the barfly trader. Okay? You, can only, you can only have fun when the market is open. And when you're just trying to get lucky or score, that's the only time that you're ever going to experience you know, any happiness, but is that the correct way to do it? If you're looking to build a meaningful relationship with your craft, if you're looking to, um, build a solid foundation and <clears throat> have meaningful growth as a trader, um, is that the right way to do it? A happy trader takes joy in understanding the markets, researching preparation and reviewing trades and market results. Again, even if the market is closed, okay. Because with a happy trader, there's no distinction between the week and the weekend because they have goals and things they can work towards even when the market's not open. They have books they can read. They have ideas they can research. They have back testing they can do. They have charts they can look at. There's always something you can grow um, into when you're trading. And the market doesn't necessarily have to be open um, for you to experience those things because they're immersed in the entire process of trading. They're not just trying to learn the bare minimum that they need to learn in order to make some money and leave. Okay. That's the difference. So here's a useful, uh, self-assessment exercise for happiness. So what you want to do is log the hours you spend working on your trading outside of uh, formal market hours, or in this case, just any time that you're not trading. So if you take, you know, if you normally don't trade, trade Fridays, okay. Uh, but you do research on Fridays. So log the hours you spend working on your trading outside of when you would normally be trading and then how you feel during those times. Do you get bursts of joy when you find new patterns and ideas? Do you develop a deep sense of mastery when you work on yourself and improve your craft? Do your ongoing efforts at figuring out markets and enhancing your performance bring a sense of pride and satisfaction? Those things all matter because if you can, if you can feel just as happy and fulfilled when you learn something new in your research, uh, because you're reading a book on the weekend, as you do when you're making a green trade, then you're on, then you're on the right track because you're fueling the correct type of happiness for uh, successful trading and successful growth. If you're not spending time on your trading outside of formal market hours, trading probably isn't your calling. So think of it like a job, right? If we, if we look at this in any other type of profession, uh, if a priest only cared about their religion from nine to five, they're not going to be a very good priest. If an artist only paints when there's an art show active, they're probably not going to be a very good artist, right? Uh, so you want to approach trading the same way. If trading is a calling, if trading is a career, if trading is a craft, you need to treat it as such and you need to immerse yourself in as much knowledge uh, about that craft as you can. Uh, and that includes not just doing the bare minimum to make a buck when the market's open and then leaving. When trading is truly a part of you and contributing to your happiness, you're more likely to be immersed in the activities that build skills and yield pattern recognition. So again, you want to be feeding the, uh, the happiness inside of you when it comes to trading, because you are more apt to not just build those skills, but retain them and then create those positive, meaningful experiences through those patterns and through those ideas that you are, um, you know, living and recreating for yourself. Now, another part of trading success is finding the niche that sustains this immersion. Okay. Don't treat 
trading like a job. Again, don't treat it like a job, treat it like a calling. Don't just go clock in and do the absolute bare minimum until you clock out and leave. Trading is a craft. Treat it as such. Learn everything you can. Immerse yourself in the entire experience, and that will ultimately lead to your success in the industry. Get in the zone. Now, most traders know the experience of being quote unquote in the zone, right? It's a, it's a peak experience. It's what we call a period of flow, a period when the trader feels at one with their performance and they are executing skills in a highly competent manner uh, without conscious effort. Okay. So in sports, they call this the hot hands, you know, um, idea, uh, for those of you that are, uh, fans of the beer pong, you know, they call it heating up right? Where you're just sinking every shot and everything feels just effortless. Now, most people think that being in the zone is an emotional state. Well, I have news for you. It's not. Entering quote unquote, the zone is just immersion. All it is, is an immersion in what you're doing to build total focus and a state of heightened attention. That's all it is. So traders find the most accuracy when they're immersed in the markets. And that means actively trying to solve the market puzzle and apply that insight to any possible trades that present themselves. So which, again, what you want to be doing is not just learning the bare minimum to get in, make a buck and get out. You want to understand the context and, and solve that market puzzle that's enveloping your trade so that you understand everything that's happening and you're immersing yourself in the total market experience. Mechanical trading without problem solving removes the market context, which leaves the experience empty. Again, it's the whole idea of I bought a new position. I had no, no clue what was going to happen and the trade went up and I, I made some money. Well, that's not very engaging. Now, if I saw what the market was doing and I solved the market puzzle and I built a thesis and I built a trading plan and then I en enacted that trading plan and I created profit for myself, that's much more engaging. That's a much more satisfying experience because when you're trading mechanically, cognitively speaking, there's no meat on the bone. So your attention remains unengaged and you can't enter that, that quote unquote zone of focus and attention. Now, a big portion of this is risk. Okay. A lot of traders who want to trade mechanically or who try to trade mechanically attempt to create a counterfeit zone with poor risk management. And what this does is it creates terrible, horrible, fatal psychological patterns. Now, what that means is traders who aren't intrinsically interested in the markets and the process of trading attempt to create interest and attention by upping their, uh, by upping their position sizes and ignoring risk management. And the problem with this is once a trader habituates to one level of risk, a higher level of risk is needed to grab interest and attention. Okay. So it's like a junkie, right? Nothing is as good as your first high. So you continue to up the ante and you continue to, to stretch your risk. And if a trader needs the excitement of risk to sustain interest, that's a sign of gambling addiction, not a passion for the markets. Okay. At that point, if you, if the only way you can get a kick out of trading is to go big or go home, um, one, you're going to blow up your trading account. And uh, two, that's a sign of addiction. It's not a sign that you are treating this as a business, as a craft. Okay. One of the best ways to keep yourself out of a zone or a flow uh, or a flow state is to focus on yourself rather than the performance, right? So if your goal is to operate in the zone, thinking about your performance while performing is a recipe for disaster, which really comes down to stop focusing on your P and L. Okay. So when you think about basketball, right? When Michael Jordan goes to make that shot, all he's thinking about is I'm going to make this shot the best shot I can possibly make. It doesn't matter if we're winning or losing the game. It doesn't matter what's happening outside of this. I'm going to make this shot the best I can possibly make it. Okay. So that you want to um, apply that same idea to your trades where it doesn't matter what else is happening. Every trade needs to be the best trade you can possibly um, make it. And you want to make that the best performance of a trade that you possibly can. If a trader needs to make money, it's very difficult to weather market ups and downs and stay focused on trade idea executions and plans. Okay. So again, don't think about the performance as you're performing. Okay. 
if today's trade is required to provide tomorrow's food and shelter, there can be no zone because anxiety will naturally take over whenever profits are threatened. So if you're putting too much pressure on your trade, or if you're thinking too much about the ramifications of that trade, um, anxiety is going to take over and it's going to, it's going to naturally stress you out. If a trader becomes psychologically attached to profitability and begins basing self-esteem and identity on trading results, they no longer control their trading experience. The market controls them. Don't be afraid to have a red day. You're not, you're not less of a trader for having a red day, but this goes back to the idea that, you know, not all green trades are good trades and not all red trades are bad trades. So it's more about the entire process and understanding that you can make a good trade and still have it be red. And it doesn't mean that you're a terrible trader and you need to not be linking your self-esteem and your identity to making sure that you're only um, having green trades. The experience of a flow state requires a basic level of control over what the trader is doing. What does that mean? How do we reduce performance pressure on ourselves as a trader? Well, the number one answer for, for most people is going to be diversification. This allows us to be fully immersed in what we're doing and so that you don't have everything, all your eggs in one basket, right? That, that allows you to reduce that performance pressure and performance anxiety just a little bit. Now, diversification, um, for those who don't know, is having multiple options to trade and not risking everything on one single trade. Okay? A trader who risks a small portion of their account on a trade can stay focused on executing an overall trade plan because one loss isn't going to be everything. Okay? There is no dire need for that trade to work and no threat if it fails. Now, this creates a uh, psychological paradox, right? To best focus on any single performance, it helps to have diversified uh, amongst performances. So in order to, to focus on the one trade that you are currently taking, it helps if you know that there's plenty of other opportunities, plenty of other trades, and that you're not risking everything on the one trade that you're attempting to take. To keep flow state performance, don't put all of your psychological eggs in the trading basket be diversified in life. All right, now we're linking this back to who who we are as people, right? Not just as traders. You can best coach yourself by ensuring that trading is one amongst many fulfilling activities in your life. If your life is full in other ways, you can weather ups and downs in trading performance. Because at that point, you no longer need trading to work and you can focus on the process of trading and immersion to help keep you in the zone. So if you are fulfilled in other areas of your life and you're, you're finding meaning in other things you're doing in life, then you don't need every trade to be green because trading is the only thing you have and trading is, the, you know, if trading doesn't work out, then you're a failure. And that's what's important to keep in mind uh, when you're taking care of yourself. And if you want to ultimately be able to enter into this flow state type of performance or to trade in the zone, you need to make sure to create these scenarios for yourself so you allow yourself that, that attention and that focus without distraction and without stress and without anxiety. Trade with energy. Fatigue is the enemy of concentration. Happiness, enthusiasm, motivation, and general contentment are difficult to sustain when you feel mentally and physically run down. So when we're run down, we're more likely to fall back into unhealthy habits and patterns. And it requires sustained focus sustained focus to remain goal oriented. And the problem is that sustained focus is draining. And so when we try to sustain focus and we're not prepared for it, we become tired and we need a break to recharge. And then we, when we become fatigued, we lose active direction and begin trading passively, right? Or we lose direction and fall back into those unhealthy habits and patterns that we are trying so hard to overcome in our training and learning journey. Now, an active trader is someone who uh, researches markets, identifies distinct areas of opportunity, and consciously executes and manages trades to optimize that opportunity. With an active trader, nothing is left to chance and everything is pre-planned, right? Everything from where to pursue that opportunity, where to sit back, 
where to take profits and where to limit losses. Okay. This takes sustained focus because good trading is intentional. It is a direct act of will. It is that viewing the market puzzle, creating the thesis, creating the trade plan, enacting that trade plan, sticking to that trade plan, and then taking your profit. That is a, a direct act of will. So what happens when we're physically drained? Well, we lose the ability to sustain intentional focus. We begin to neglect research. We fail to calibrate risk and reward correctly, or we fall back on simple heuristics and enter trades based on simple reasoning that may lack a true edge, right? Oh, well, you know what? I'm, I'm tired and this looks like it's going to go up, so I'm going to go long. Or, oh, I'm tired and this looks like it's going to drop short, so I'm going to go short. Or you become emotionally reactive and you chase price, okay? Or you fail to take the time to assess broader context decisions in your trades. So these are all the things that you want to not do. And these are the things that you will naturally lean towards doing if you're physically drained. So how as traders do we manage energy? Well, you get proper sleep and, and make sure you get a good quality of sleep. You eat properly, maintain your body properly. You take breaks throughout the day to make sure that you're not exhausting yourself. Okay. Remember that a trading career is a marathon, not a sprint. And the winners are always going to be the ones who pace themselves. Okay. Now, again, I recognize none of these guidelines are groundbreaking revelations, but many of us traders tend to ignore um, at least some of the above bullet points. Okay. Uh, we spend lots of time and money uh, to prepare our trades, but we often fail to prepare ourselves for trading. We'll spend all this time creating this strategy that works. You can have a strategy that's 100% effective and efficient, but if you are not physically and mentally in a place where you can enact the strategy correctly, you can still lose money every single trade. And that's what, that's what we sometimes fail to remember, right? We fail to prepare ourselves for the trading that we need to be doing. So here's a basic breakdown. If you lack energy, you'll lack focus. And then if you lack focus, you'll lack intentionality. And if you lack intentionality, you'll lack the ability to follow a trading plan. And if you lack the ability to follow a trading plan, you'll probably lose money. Okay. So your energy level is directly correlated to your quality of trading. The opportunity is not just a function of a moving market. It's a function of your, your ability to capitalize on that market. So keep that in mind always. Intention and greatness. Exercise the brain through play. So what is intentionality? Intentionality is the ability to sustain purposeful activities over time. It's the ability to sustain attention and concentration, coordinate a series of activities towards a chosen end, and persistently try different approaches towards solving a problem until a solution is reached. So being in the zone results from a complete absorption in one's activities. And when we are completely focused on what we're doing, we reach a state in which performance seems almost effortless and completely natural. So passion for the work represents passion for the flow state of this work. Okay. Great individuals across a variety of professions are unusually productive, and that's that intentionality. They stay productive. They stay at that level of intention in order to create that flow state. Okay. When we pursue goals in, our effort, in an effortful manner, we build intentionality and free will. Facets of intentionality, such as attention, planning, and reasoning, are functions of the brain's frontal cortex. So traders want to utilize and strengthen that region of the brain for optimum function, which will then create um, a path towards that flow state or to be able to, to get into the zone. So does trading exercise these functions of the brain? Well, they don't if you're just trading passively and clicking the mouse without uh, direct thought. Okay, that's passive trading and you're trading basically without intent. And when we trade on autopilot, our brain muscles atrophy because we're not using them. So how do you avoid being a passive trader? Well, you create situations for yourself that encourage intentional thought during your trades. So we're most able to sustain concentration and exercise. Uh, 
we're most able to sustain concentration and exercise intentional thinking during activities that interest us and fit our skill set. So again, stick to your niche, day trading, swing trading, investing, because that is what you're going to be um, interested in. That's going to be what you want to learn more about. That's going to be what you're going to want to be paying more attention to. Okay? So trader performance. So talent leads to interests. Okay. Interests lead to immersion and skill building. Immersion and skill building leads to competence. Competence leads to further flow. And then further flow leads to elite performance. So that's the entire journey from passion to um, profitability right there. Okay. Um, because you start by knowing what you're good at, which will tell you what you want to do. And then once you know what you want to do, you will know what you're going to work towards. Okay. And then once you know what you're going to work towards, that's what you get good at. And then once you know what you're good at, then you can optimize on that and start creating, uh, you know, profits on, on those trades. It is the interplay between the flow state and the development of intentionality that creates accelerated learning curves. So without flow, talents have no place to go and never evolve into elite skill. So you want to do everything you possibly can to align all of your interests and all your hard work into a flow state or into a zone, because that is where you are going to see the best results. So many traders fail because they're attempting to operate outside of their niche is defined by the intersection of these talents, interests, and skills. They attempt something that doesn't intrinsically interest them or play to their abilities. Due to this, they never truly encounter a flow state. And without flow, the trader lacks the motivational impetus to sustain efforts. And that prevents them from ever cultivating true intentionality. And then the traders wonder why they can't stick to their trading plans or they sabotage themselves with impulsive traits. Well, it's because you are trying to do something that's outside of that intersection of your talents, interests, and skills. So what is the first step in performance development? Well, play and practice. So traders need to quote unquote play with various aspects of the market to understand what interests them. Research and play with various trading styles and approaches. This helps traders experience and understand what they appreciate in a trading style. And it gives them examples to appreciate the difference between trades made from rapid pattern recognition and trades made from rigorous analysis. So we know that elite performers never stop playing and exploring. They're always trying new things, always trying new strategies, always uh, trying to learn new methods, always checking out new indicators, always checking out, you know, uh, new approaches because play uh, when you play around in the markets, it's a means of self-discovery to uncover hidden talents you never knew you had. So when you try everything, you might find that there is that there is an approach or an aspect of the market that you never knew that you had an interest in or that you never knew that you were good at. You know, So you want to make sure that you are continuously trying new things and that you engage your brain in that sense of, of play because that allows you to grow um, in that state of flow, in that state of intention, uh, to ultimately reach profitability. Cultivate the quiet mind. So the number one question is, what is a quiet mind? Well, a mind at peace is one that can be fully focused on market patterns. Essentially, it's a mind that embraces serenity. Okay. We as a society are overstimulated. We're overstimulated by social media, by television, by radio, by music, by our cell phones, by our computers. Okay. So the quiet mind is, uh, attributes the ideas that in the absence of the ability to create our own stimulation, many of us equate the absence of stimulation to boredom. So I'm going to say that again, in the absence of the ability to create our own stimulation. So in the absence of the social media and the cell phones and things like that, that overstimulate us, many of us equate the absence of stimulation to boredom. Okay. So the absence of stimulation is not boredom. It's just the absence of stimulation because boredom is neither good nor bad. It's just an empty state where there's nothing of interest. Okay. So the aversion to boredom is a huge problem for most traders because 
because we are so overstimulated by things, we, we crave that. So whenever there's a moment where we're not being overly stimulated, we essentially get bored and there's, you know, we, we start uh, thinking there's nothing to do and we start getting into our own heads about things. So within that boredom, traders will seek out bad trades or size positions incorrectly because they're looking to create excitement and interest in the market because they're bored. Okay. Most traders consider emotion to be their enemy when in fact boredom is responsible for more bad trades than emotion is. I'm going to read that again. Most traders consider emotion to be their enemy when in fact boredom is responsible for more bad trades than emotion. That's very important. Trading expertise hinges on the ability to detect and act on patterns that occur within noisy market data. So having that gut feeling or developing a gut feeling isn't a hunch. It's the result of multiple repetitions of rules and patterns. And so we need to be able to access that intuition um, in order to see, to feel that gut feeling. And in order to access that intuition, we need to have a still mind or a quiet mind. When we're distracted and divided, we lose our feel for the market. And then we lose the ability to, to, read and analyze and solve that larger market puzzle. Implicit pattern recognition manifests itself as a sense of feel or as a felt sense. If a trader is not attending to those subtle cues of body and minds, they'll miss the signals altogether. This is why serenity is so important because with a quiet mind, we can attend to the subtle cues of pattern recognition. And then most importantly, those who fear boredom will never achieve the still mind. So you, you need to be able to just sit and watch and do nothing and just be. <laughs> and our day and age, that's, that's kind of difficult to do, but that's what's, what's required in order to pick up on those subtle market cues. So when you are your own trading coach, it's important to keep your mind in shape, much like an athlete states in proper conditioning for, uh, for a game. So what you want to do uh, is take five to 10 minutes every morning prior to the start of trading and sit quietly and mindfully to help soothe and quiet the mind before the bell. Traders who practice this enough get into the habit to be able to quiet their minds on demand after enough, enough repetition after a while. So just as you prepare for the day's trading by studying recent market action, reviewing charts and identifying areas of opportunity, it makes sense to engage in mental preparation to build the mindset needed to capitalize on those ideas or to build the mindset needed to understand and read those cues that are going to give you, um, that are going to be um, uh, red flags or alarms or alerts for those um, types of opportunities that you're looking for in the market. Build emotional resilience. So we're going to tell your story, right? We're going to, I'm going to start with an example. Three traders place the exact same trade. All of them lose money. All three trades go bad. Okay. Trader number one becomes discouraged, curses the market and gives up for the day. Trader number two vows to get their money back, trades more aggressively, loses and loses more money. And trader number three pulls back, reassesses their strategy, waits for a clear area of opportunity, makes a good trade and ends up breaking even on the day. So I ask you, what is the difference between these traders? Well, as you can probably guess by now, resilience. Resilience is the ability to maintain high levels of functioning, even in the face of significant stresses. So a trader who lacks resilience is thrown through loops by a bad trade, by something unexpected, by something confusing, um, because they expect everything to go their way all the time. A key reason why traders lack resilience is because they take negative events personally. The market is the market. Nothing's out to get you. Your trade isn't out to get you. So some portions, these, these traders that lack resilience see that some portion of their self-worth is tied to every single green trade. So when events go well, they feel really good. They feel awesome because they're awesome because they can, every trade is green. But then when they encounter any kind of roadblock, they become really discouraged, really doubtful, and really frustrated. So here's an, here's an example of ways to implement resilience. Okay. So a trader researches a new pattern that they want to try. So they see a setup for this pattern and they're attempting taking the trade and they're thinking about how they're going to size their position, whether they should size, 
you know, a normal position uh, with a normal amount of shares as they always do, or whether they should take a smaller position side for this particular trade. So I think about what happens if the trade goes against them, and then they decide to take a smaller position because the trade is untested. So they're trying something, a new pattern um, that they've never tested before. So they said, okay, I'm going to risk less in this trade. So that way, if anything goes wrong, I'm not losing, you know, a, a, a huge amount of money. A smaller trade means that they care less about the implications of the trade on their portfolio. They place the trade, observe the pattern in real time, make a small profit, and then start to implement that pattern into their trading plan. So by selecting the smaller trade size, what they were doing was setting a psychological resist resilience level for themselves for that trade. Because by trading small, the trader kept themselves in a favorable state regardless of the trade outcome. The purpose of the trade was greater than the outcome of the trade because the point of the trade was not to make money, the point of the trade was to test the strategy. Okay. So traders learn to build their resilience over time and adopt to stresses that at one time might have been overwhelming. So in this case, the trader saw the new trade they wanted to try, so they started with a small position size. And if that trade went well, then maybe the next trade, they go a little bit bigger, and then a little bit bigger, and then a little bit bigger until they get to their normal position sizing. The key here is that you do it one step at a time. Because what you want to remember is that when we master one level of challenge, we're essentially building a fundamental resilience so that we can take a step up for that next level. The most effective way of building emotional resilience is to experience repeated normal drawdowns and then seeing your own experience that you can overcome them. So the trader who experiences repeated drawdowns only to later hit fresh quality highs know they have nothing to fear during normal performance pullbacks. Now the thing I want to stress here is normal performance pullbacks. So that means my strategy, you know, says I enter at this level and my risk tolerance means that price can pull back to this level. So that pullback may be a little uncomfortable, but I know that it's within my risk tolerance because that's what my strategy allows for. Now, if you're in a position and you're completely upside down and you don't know what to do and you're freaking out and you have no plan, that's not a normal performance pullback. That means that you should get out of that trade, reassess, figure out a new strategy, figure out your risk profile, and then get back into it. Okay, that's the difference. So just another couple things to clarify. Resiliency doesn't mean just jumping into another trade after sustaining a loss. Resiliency is sustaining well-being after these normal expected losing trades. And remember that the resilient trader uh, can decide to stop trading or continue trading after a loss. What really matters is that what really matters is it's the following of basic time-tested plans and strategies rather than impulsively running towards or away from risk after a loss that defines um, those of us that are authentically resilient and those who aren't. Integrity and doing the right thing. There can be no self-esteem without a self, and that's a well-defined sense of who one is and what one stands for. Now, there are many false substitutes for self-esteem. Two of the largest ones are the approval of others, and then for us traders, the size of our trading account. Self-esteem is a function of knowing yourself and remaining true to your values. Really, it's about possessing a vision of what can be and then remaining faithful to that vision. Here's where we get into the problem. Many traders have no more vision than a desire to make money. Again, we've talked about, you know, those bar fly traders that they say, I'm going to do the least amount of work just to get some money and then get out. Now, there's nothing wrong with making money, but latching onto these holy grail types of ideas instead of relying on planning and judgment can be really dangerous. Looking for an easy score uh, in place of taking on the larger challenge of building good habits and patterns will ultimately lead to failure. Now, we see this a lot with people who sign up for, um, you know, these bogus systems that are just, you know, mimic trading or alerts, buy here, sell here. You know, if you're just buying here and selling here because someone told you to, you have no clue what you're doing. So if anything goes wrong, there's no way for you to know, you know, where things went wrong. Or if something feels uncomfortable, there's no need to, there's nowhere to know whether or not that comfort is normal because, or that discomfort is normal because you don't really have a plan for this trade. You're just following someone else. As a trader, your strategy needs to stand for something. Each trader should have their own view of why the markets move, not something borrowed from a guru or an idea sold by a current fad. Now, that being said, you can pull inspiration from others, but every great 
uh, trader has an outlook instead of methods that are distinctly their own. Basically, you should be able to explain your trading system without buy here and sell here. You know, you say, okay, my trading system is patterns. And so I notice that when these patterns start to occur, when the markets are doing this, um, this is what I'm starting to look for. Again, remember to integrate that larger market puzzle into your trade. If you are using an indicator, understand why that indicator works the way it works. You know, it's not just buy at this level, sell at this level. When price is at this level, what does that mean? When price is overbought, oversold, what does that mean? You know, you don't want to be explaining things like, well, my indicator says that when this dot hits this number, I have to buy. And when this dot hits this number, I have to sell. Why are you buying and selling when that dot hits that number? What does that dot mean? What does that number mean? That type of thing. You want to make sure that you have a greater understanding of what you're doing rather than a simple buy at this number or line or dot and sell at this number, line and dot. The true source of emotional resilience is belief in the idea. So this feeds pride and esteem so deep that you are unwilling to compromise yourself in the face of setbacks and disappointments. Again, if you understand what you're looking at, right? And you say, so let's say you have a trading system and then price pulls back and it touches your stop out price, but you understand what's happening in the larger market puzzle. And you can say, oh, you know what? It did touch my stop. And normally this stop is where I would get out but I'm seeing this that's abnormal and price is going to turn around and continue moving in my direction because of these factors, because the market's doing this, because the sector's doing this, because I'm seeing these other things. It just gives you more context so that you can build that resilience so that you're not freaking out when something unexpected happens to you. So you want to ask yourself, what about your trading plan is distinctly yours? What have you developed that most distinguishes you as a trader? What is the vision behind your trading? What is your core and essence as a trader? Again, explaining your trading strategy and what you're thinking in broader uh, macro concepts. You know, If you can't provide detailed answers to these questions, are you truly ready to risk your capital? If you don't, uh, essentially, if you don't know what you're doing, then you're not treating every trade like a financial decision. You're treating every trade like a gamble. And if you do that, will you really have the confidence to weather adversity with only borrowed ideas and, and other people's methods to draw upon? If you have no substance to your, to your trading idea, how will you know, you know whether or not you can believe in yourself and believe in that idea? Maximize confidence and stay with your trades. So we're going to go basic here. What is a stop loss? A stop loss is a point in price that tells the trader that their initial trade idea was wrong. Professional traders adhere to their stop losses immediately. A stop loss is a certainty, not a cause for consternation. Professional traders know that once they hit that stop loss, that, that doesn't mean maybe I should start thinking about getting out. That means I've already thought about it and this stop is the most amount of risk I'm willing to risk or the most amount of money I'm willing to risk for this trade idea or this trade that I'm trying to take. And if this trade idea or this trade hypothesis that I made is wrong, this is the most money I'm willing to lose. A good trader learns from these losses and uses them to rewrite market views. A stop is, is not always a bad thing. A stop can, can mean, you know, hey, every time I take this specific type of trade or every time I have this trading hypothesis, I always get stopped out. Why is that? Is there something I need to look at? Is there something I need to change to make my trades more effective? Professional traders understand that a, a loss can effectively set up the next winning trade. Okay. Now, us as traders, we talk about stop losses all the time. But one thing that traders talk about much less are stop profits. So what are stop profits? So traders who adhere religiously to stop losses may find it hard to let winning trades run. And they stop their profits prematurely, reducing the reward portion of their risk reward profile. Now there's all kinds of reasons for stop losses. Some of them are that sometimes, um, Sometimes profit targets are harder to identify than stop targets because profit targets can have many different factors. It's easier to stick with a trade when there's a firm target in mind, just like it's easier to get work done when you have a clear goal in mind. So sometimes if profit keeps running past that firm target, um, you're not sure what, what to do in that situation because it's easier just to say, I'm going to keep this trade until XYZ point, right? 
Another reason could be lack of confidence in the actual trade idea. Now this goes back to what we were talking about, about how you need to be invested in your, in your trade and understand the larger market puzzle. And you're not just going to do the least or the least amount of work you can possibly do to make money and then get out. You want to understand the macro view. You want to understand the larger puzzle that's around and surrounding your individual trade so that you have confidence when you take a trade. Now, another, another reason might be a trader's risk aversion um, because, you know, they might just be hesitant to let those profits run past a certain point. Seeing a trade through to its target requires an unusual degree of security and ability to tolerate uncertainty. As the trade moves further in your favor, you have more money and paper profits that you're exposing to risk. So if you are in a trade and you're up $5, you can tell yourself, no, I have to stay in this trade because I've only made $5 and I still have much more money to make. If you're in a trade and you're up a hundred, five hundred, a thousand dollars. Now you start thinking the opposite. You start thinking, oh my goodness, I have five hundred dollars. I have a thousand dollars in my unrealized PL. I don't want to lose that. So now what do I do? Should I wait? Should I get out? What's going on? The ability to sit through a winning trade as you accumulate profits requires more confidence um, in the initial trade plan. So again, that larger market puzzle, you want to know that the trade that you're taking, you understand not just the trade, but you understand what it is you're trying to accomplish in the larger market in general, in the larger context, by immersing yourself in that market so that you have confidence in that initial trade plan. Ironically, it usually takes more confidence to sit in a winning trade than it does to actually take the trade. Because again, that's when your mind starts kind of, when your emotions start messing with you, when fear kind of starts to creep in. So how do you achieve the level of confidence needed to sit through or all the way through good trades? It's not the loss of the paper trade that's the real threat to the trader. If you keep moving your stop up with your profits, you're going to undoubtedly make a profit because once you are in the green and you move your stop up to a level that's in the green, you're effectively playing with house money. So you won't come out red, but the question is how green are you going to be? How green does your initial trade say you should be? And then how green are your emotions telling you that you need to be? The real threat to traders lies in how they process a retracement. So instead of viewing the reversal as a sign of nothing lost, they criticize themselves for the missed opportunity or lapse in the discomfort of the situation. In their mind, it's the discomfort and second guessing that the trader is avoiding, not the paper loss itself. So I'm going to say that again. In their mind, it's the discomfort and second guessing that's affecting the trading, that's affecting the trader, not the actual P&L themselves. That's why you have this phrase, you're never wrong taking profits. Traders often think that they're managing a trade when they exit prematurely, when really what they're managing is their thoughts and feelings. Okay, so if your initial trade says, you know, this trade idea that I have, um, this trade strategy that I have that's that I've done the work through, that I've that I've tested, that I understand, says that I should be taking fifteen hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars worth of profit. But once you get to a hundred dollars worth of profit, you start to freak out and then you exit the trade. Well, you never go wrong taking a profit, but you also cut your trade idea you know, by 80%, you cut yourself way short. So did you not believe in your trade idea? Did you not understand your trade idea? And that's what you want to make sure that you're understanding how that's affecting you when you're cutting your profits early. So a large part of confidence is trust. If you aren't letting your trade ideas see themselves through to conclusion, you undercut your own confidence by never allowing yourself to develop trust in those trade ideas that you're placing in those trade hypotheses that you, that you have. You can only endure the uncertainty of a trade that moves in your favor by seeing in your own experience that the discomfort is endurable and that you gain more from sticking through it than by freaking out and taking profits early. So confidence is not just a function of how you think, but also how you act. So what you want to do is you want to instill a confident mindset. So before you start trading, mentally rehearse, before you take a trade, mentally rehearse all possible scenarios and what you're going to tell yourself when you experience uh, that trade discomfort. You say, what's going to happen if 
a huge burst of volume hits and this thing, you know, my profits double or triple out of nowhere. What happens if something crazy happens in the market and I get a pullback that I wasn't expecting? You run yourself through all those scenarios so you already know what you're thinking and you already know what you're going to tell yourself. Because when you prepare yourself in advance for adverse conditions, you basically remove their threat value. Because if you know something's coming and you know how you're going to handle it, then it's no longer a threat. You just stick to your plan. And then you want to build on small changes. So make small changes to your position to help build that confidence. Maybe when you're starting, when you get to um, you know a certain level, you take 90% of your profits and leave 10% of your profits in the trade with a break-even stop loss. That way you're still taking profits, but you're also building your tolerance for discomfort in that trade so that it runs so that you're not stopping out your losses. Remember that if you act with confidence, even in small measure, you can coach yourself um, to self-trust and a deeper internalization of that confidence, which will ultimately make you a better trader and a more successful trader and will help build that resilience. Coping, turning stress into well-being. We can manage stress and avoid it becoming distress if we have a good well-being. Now, coping is a strategy for handling these stressful situations so that they don't turn into distressful situations. One thing you have to remember is that there's no single most effective coping strategy. The best practices for coping depend 100% on you, the person, and the things that um, you think and the things that you do. So be aware that coping strategies change as you change. So something that might have worked for you when you were younger may not necessarily work for you now as you've grown or changed or tried to incorporate uh, new thoughts and ideas into your life. You can recognize failed coping strategies when you look back on your actions and wonder why you reacted that way. So in this case, when you look back on your trades and then you wonder why you um, reacted or acted in certain situations when confronted with certain market factors. So here's a good example. Many traders have aggressive personalities and like to face life's problems head on. This works really well if you're negotiating a business deal or processing bad news, but in the markets, you don't necessarily always want to be aggressive. If a trader's had multiple losses, they might try to confront the market head on by increasing their position size and trading more frequently. So what they think they're doing is they think that they're confronting stress when really they're just throwing their risk management out the window. This is how, this is a pure example of how a bad coping mechanism can blow up a trading account. So how can you know which strategy works best for you in certain situations? Ah, we have an exercise. So here we go. A little self-assessment. What you want to do is think back to situations in which you've handled trades well, and then times you've handled trades poorly. So I'm going to list a couple of coping statements uh, or ideas, and then take note of which of the following actions you've taken during good trades, and then which you've taken during bad trades. All right, so here we go. I've reached out to others for feedback. I took steps to make sure I didn't overreact. I stepped back from the situation and figured out what to do next. I tried not to make a big deal out of the problem. I looked for what I could take away from the situation that would help me in the future. Uh, I made a concerted effort to tackle the problem right then and there. I recognized my mistake and took action. I decided to stop trading for a while and regain perspective. Now, the thing you want to remember is that there's no right or wrong answer to those. The yes or no is just for you personally. This is how you associate mechanisms that work best for you, as well as ones that are associated with your problem trades. If you, con if you contrast your best and worst coping, you identify what you need to do to sustain a favorable balance between well-being and distress. So an important dimension of coping is that of action and reflection. So depending on the kind of person you are, some traders uh, take prompt action right away to address their mistakes. And then other traders think best when they take a step back, maybe regain a little bit of emotional control, and then analyze to put things in perspective. Now we've got a couple different coping styles. We've got problem-faced coping, which is putting feelings completely aside, analyzing and focusing on active problem solving to address the problem. And then emotional focused, emotion focused coping, which is venting and getting the problem off your chest, cooling down, dampening the negative emotions, and then analyzing your problem. Most traders run into problems when they fail to enact their best coping strategies. 
when you track how you cope when you're trading well, you create a mental model for your best ways of handling trading challenges. And then you know through that model, if these are things that I do, you know, when I'm trading well, I want to recreate those things as much as possible. So once you have that model, again, this can then become a script that you draw upon uh, during times of difficulty in the future, in future trades. All right, everyone, so that is the end of part three. Uh, we're just going to do a quick recap with a couple bullet points of psychological well-being. Make sure you take care of yourself. If you're going to maximize your performance, you need to make the most of your concentration, motivation, and energy. Understand that how you manage your life will show in how you manage your trading, and you always want to be proactive in finding the best coping mechanisms that allow you to maximize your well-being. All of this is going to create a rock-solid foundation, psychologically, to build upon. All right. Well, like I said, that's the end of um, this part three video. Uh, if you want to read more on your own, I encourage you to, to pick up this book. You can get it on Amazon, The Daily Trading Coach, 101 Lessons for Becoming Your Own Trading Psychologist by Brett N. Steenbarger. Um, this thing is great. I mean, here at Bullish Bears, we love it, which is why we're doing these videos. Uh, so this is the end of part three. Part four should be coming out uh, soon. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, I will see you guys then.